Hello and welcome back to Job Math. I'm Dale. This is the podcast for only the most fabulous Gen Z professionals, brought to you by Career Badger. Learn more by visiting www.careerbadger.io or download our mobile app to get live human career coaching chat with our resident career coach, Lisa. Speaking of whom? Hey everyone, I'm Lisa. Just a reminder that this podcast is for you if you want to unleash your potential and get the career you want. Don't forget to go ahead and follow and subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. And today, we are lifting the lid on careers in marketing. Very excited to tell you about our guest today, who has worked as a chief marketing officer in a range of senior marketing roles at multiple companies, including Google, and has been a founder and is also now a podcast host. Someone who, as we like to say, has been there, seen it, and done it all. We are joined by our guest, Melissa. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Moody, and I have recently been told that I am not a 20-year career marketer. I am, in fact, an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur stuck in a marketing career. So my current role, I am actually, my title currently is general manager of a software company called Matcha. Um, and in the past, I have done everything from, you know, I started as my career actually started out as a teacher. I moved into marketing after a few years in the education space and grew rapidly, as you mentioned, at Google over those 14 years at Google, and then made the big leap from big tech to small scale startup. So I have seen marketing, as you mentioned, at the biggest companies and at the ground zero smallest companies. And marketing as a career is something that is by nature highly varied and has a lot of different moving parts. And so for someone who likes to do a lot of different things, marketing is a great space for me. Awesome intro. Thanks, Melissa. So <laughs> both my parents were teachers, so you've got to scratch the stitch for me. How does that transition go from teacher to Google? Because um, I think you're the only one of these I've caught in the wild. Um, <laughs> tell us that story, please. Yes, I've seen a lot more people recently um, making a shift from teaching into tech in general, but I actually think teaching to marketing is a absolutely makes perfect sense for a lot of folks. So um, I will start by saying I'm still extremely passionate about teaching and education. It is one of the most important things we can do. But I learned in my career as a teacher that one of the things I do is run really, really, really fast. I like to change things. I like to break things. I like to do things new. And education as an industry isn't the fastest moving industry, to put it nicely. Um, so, you know, recognizing that about myself, um, I moved locations and I decided to take that location shift. Um, this was back in like 2006 and rethink what I was doing from a career perspective. So I took what I knew in education, which is you have knowledge or a message, you have an audience or your students, and you need to get them to understand that message. You need the outcome, right? Like if you haven't taught your students anything, they haven't learned, you haven't succeeded. Well, that's marketing. You have a message, you have an audience, and you need them to receive and take action on that message. So yes, I um, got to the West Coast in about 2006. After quite a few years of teaching, I have my master's in education. And I decided that I was going to move into the corporate world. And the way that I did that was take that story that I just told you about being skilled at crafting a message, delivering the message, measuring and understanding the outcomes. I walked in and I said, you need me on your marketing team. And I decided to just pick a bunch of companies that I thought were most exciting in the Seattle area at the time. Um, I was very, very fortunate. And yes, it was a heck of a process to get through Google uh, interviewing, even in 2007. Um, but I was very, very thrilled to land an incredible role at Google, um, basically on the junior side of the marketing scope, um, and then was extremely fortunate to learn and be challenged and grow over 14 years in that organization. So um, you can imagine I had exposure to all sorts of marketing um, over those 14 years, everything from learning the basics of SEO to getting to the point where I was managing and running global teams and very fortunate to learn there. Um, the real thing that I take away from my time at Google is I didn't learn to market in a very siloed marketing way. I learned that marketing happens 
in conjunction with delivering great products. And I've taken that with me through the rest of my career. But as we talk further, you will realize I'm not a marketer who sits in my marketing box and only does marketing. I am someone who likes to touch product and likes to touch customer success and all the elements of a business that really make your marketing successful in the end. Lovely story. Um, yeah, I think as you were talking, all of those transferable skills that, that a teacher has to master in their day-to-day -day role, um, I think maybe aren't obvious, but as you're describing them, you can sort of see those really come to life. Um, lots of lessons for product, product adoption, I imagine, with some willing and some less willing customers, shall we say, or stakeholders? Absolutely. I would also say, you know, any teacher would tell you their, their greatest strength for a great teacher has to be classroom management. And that comes in very handy with executives and board members. I'll hesitate to ask you which was the more unruly, the board members or, or the students? Ooh, troublemakers, all of them. And so you talked about that range of marketing roles at Google. Maybe paint a picture, whether with real life examples in Google, um, but maybe people starting their career and thinking marketing sounds exciting. They've mm been swayed by you know, your description and, and all of the different facets of, of marketing. What are the opportunities you're seeing now in the market for people starting their career? How might they specialize or generalize um, in, in, in a career in marketing? What does that look like? I think the thing about marketing is even if you just say the word marketing, it's massive. That's a huge term. You have everything from content marketers, brand marketers who are crafting story and brand voice to demand generation marketers who are measuring outcomes very hard and testing different channels of marketing. So if I'm running paid ads on LinkedIn or if I'm running paid ads on TikTok, then you've also got a lot of newer channels like um, people who, marketers who are focused on things like influencer marketing. How do I work with small influencers to get my brand's awareness up? You've also got things like community marketing, which people are really leaning heavier into now, which is building up um, the human element that surrounds your brand and the champions and the evangelists and getting them interested in um, maybe more than just purchasing a product. There's a lot of marketing that's focused on that right now. So marketing as a, you know, as a job function is massive. So if you're starting and you say, I want to be in marketing, there's two things I would recommend. The first is there's always benefit to being a bit of a generalist in marketing. It's good to know the pieces of marketing and how they fit together. So one of the things that I find most valuable from my time at Google was I was able to touch different components. I can tell you exactly how organic search works. And that's a big part of, you know, organic search marketing is a huge thing. Maybe we're seeing a little trend of how it's really changing in the last five, you know, five months or so. Um, Paid search, I got to touch that. I also got to touch brand marketing. Um, over time, we also worked in partnerships. I mean, what of uh, later in kind of mid career for me at Google, I was in charge of sitting down with our biggest clients who are, you know, this is Expedia, Airbnb. They're paying many, many tens of thousands or ten, tens of millions of dollars a year to Google. I got to sit down with them and talk about their strategy. So being able to understand all the different pieces of marketing and at least how they work together, a generalist approach to marketing for someone starting out the career is a good thing. Be willing to touch lots of pieces of marketing because they all do work together. The second piece there is it can be a lot and it's overwhelming. So pick something to get good at. Um, and that would be for someone starting in marketing commit to kind of a role that you can actually focus on and be learned. So if you're going to be a content marketer, go out and learn the best practices for content marketing. Try it, explore it, um, build yourself. It's We often refer to the T-shaped marketer and that's what is most important. Get a little bit of everything at the top, get some exposure, and then get yourself a skill set um, within that that you can go deep in. Because a lot of people can be generalists, but if you need a foot in the door, it's usually the, the T part of the T that really can get you in the door. When you have some expertise, you can apply. Can you recommend any resources for people to go and check out like early in their career? Like where, where might people start looking for? Wow. For marketing, that's broad. I would say, um, you know, LinkedIn is actually more than any kind of networking at this point. I think LinkedIn is a great place to learn. So go and get recommendations for a couple folks to follow and then start soaking up the information that they put out. 
Um, also, I would say, you know, get a couple of podcasts from people that not are just talking about it, but have really done it because you can learn a lot from listening to a, a good podcast or two. Um, and again, it depends where you want to be. If you want to be in B2B marketing, you know, listen to Jane Sarah's podcast about women in B2B marketing. Um, listen to the, one of the formative podcasts for me that is no longer going, but was amazing. It's called Inbound Success from Kathleen Booth, really learning about the ins and outs of marketing. So find the right podcast in the area that you want. I mean, there's a lot around just brand marketing. There's a lot around demand gen. There's a lot around B2B. Find some podcasts that you want and then definitely listen to a couple episodes. If it's not great, find another one. Um, so I would say pick a podcast or two that comes recommended in your area. And then also go to LinkedIn and start following some of the right people in your area. Those are some really good, more modern ways of resources. Besides that, you know, I mean, I worked at Google a long time. Google the courses. There are courses in almost everything. And go out and take a quick course or um, watch a YouTube series. Um, there's so much out there now that's at your fingertips. You can get a lot of that information for yourself um, without some, you know, massive course or going to school for it or anything like that. On the job training is huge for marketers. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, I certainly advocate learn by doing, right? There's no, no, there's no substitute for actually having uh, done a few months of a, of a particular discipline, whatever it may be. Yep. Um, so we talked about the transition from teaching into corporate life uh, or commercial, commercial roles. Talk us through that transition then out from a big company into being a more, more entrepreneurial or self-employed. Talk, talk us through that process. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned briefly earlier, I am someone who loves a challenge and I like to run fast. And I have learned this about myself. I think that's very important to learn what you need in a career and then to move your career forward based on that. Um, and so over time, I've learned that I am my best self and I am my best performer when I'm being challenged, when I'm actually working on something that is not easy, that I can't mail it in, that I can't just do the job and go home in the evening. That's not for everyone. But in my journey, um, I've seen that come to a head a couple times. And probably the most notable was after almost 14 years at Google, it was very clear to me that I was not being challenged, being asked to do new things, being asked to think out of the box and implement new creative strategies. Did I have a great team? Yes. Was I working on something interesting? Yes. Did I feel bored most days? Yes. And so I actually... Um, I know it's kind of weird to imagine, especially in this day of the world. This was quite a few years ago, um, but I actually just walked away from Google. I, there were a couple other reasons, one of which was also I've worked remotely for more than 10 years and um, Google was not really remote friendly. Um, no matter what it seems like externally, they they just aren't. There's a lot of policies that aren't. And so I was really ready to find a company that um, let me work remotely to the best of my abilities and let me run and do all the things I wanted to do fast. And for me, after Google, I did a lot of some paid and some unpaid consulting work in the startup world. And I just found that it scratched the itch I had to um, run fast, operate in a chaotic world and actually just make a change, like be working on something that you know, based on your efforts, you either succeed or fail. Um, and in startup world, sometimes you fail even despite your best efforts and that's okay. Um, so I personality wise and pace of life wise, and, um, just wanting to be fulfilled by my job actually led me to leave the stability of the big tech and the, um, the comfort of a known job and go into more of a risk-taking scenario. But I'm glad I did. I love it. I thrive on it. I think we've talked a little bit about the advice you've given. Uh, do you want to build on any of that advice you'd give people early in, early in their careers? Well, I will say if I'll give some advice around thinking about when to go to a startup or not. There is an insane amount of chaos in startups. And you need to enjoy operating within chaos if you're going to take part in a, in a startup. You need to be okay with the fact that your job may go away next month. You need to be okay with the fact that you may be asked to cut your budget in half at any given time. The processes you put in place are now broken because your product is succeeding wildly and you have to rebuild some processes that you already did. If you love chaos and you're okay thriving in that, the startup world is so wonderful because you get the joy 
of seeing what you've done. You get the joy of putting in work and getting the reward. But for a lot of people, it's a stress that's unpleasant. And so I would say people need to really evaluate if that type of stress gives you joy and you're able to not let it become toxic, or if, if you know that you don't operate well in that space, the startup world is not for everyone. Um, and it's a, it's okay to learn. It's okay to try, give it a try and maybe learn from yourself. The other thing is, is everyone in the startup world feels that stress. Those of us that love it, we still feel the stress, but you have to deal with it smartly. So you need to be prepared to be able to, you know, separate some of the stress of work life from your regular life and, and all of the things that go with it. Um, I actually, I think you mentioned it, but I do host a podcast. Um, it's designed for small team marketers. So it's not just startups. They, you might be an established company, but if you have a really small team, you are facing challenges that big team marketers don't have. You're, you know, less budget, fewer resources, um, probably tighter time deadlines, really changing priorities. Your priorities change all the time. And so we created this community and then the podcast around those shared challenges because it's crazy. And our tagline is, it's a marvelous mess. So it's going to be a mess. The question, if you want to join a startup is, do you love it? Is it marvelous to you or is it, I, I won't curse on your show unless I'm allowed to, but it can be a real hot mess. I don't think uh, we haven't established. I think we've had some, uh, yeah, some, some course language before. So yeah, go for it. If, uh, if, 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 the, if you uh, feel the need, listen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I will give you one more tidbit there too. I think so in this world, I'm seeing the pace of job changing is, is so much higher. And sometimes that's because we're, there's a lot of layoffs and there's a lot of um, change. I, one thing I've learned in my career is even if your job, you know, your resume on LinkedIn has gaps, or even if it has short stints at places, in today's world, I don't think there's as much bias against that. But what you have to be prepared to do is tell the story. You have to have a narrative about what you got in each of those roles and why it added to you, even if it wasn't a great scenario. Maybe one of those, you had a crappy boss. It's not about the crappy boss. It's what you learned from working in a challenging leadership environment, right? And it's not about um, you quit a job after two months. It's about why you understand what you need to work well and why that job didn't meet your needs. So there's so, I mean, this is the marketer in me, but telling your career journey, it's not covering up anything. It's telling a story of why that career journey was such. I'm a mother, right? To a lot of parents have to take a break or they have a different way that work looks during certain years. It's not that you missed out on work during those years. You might have been gaining other skills that others just don't have or, um, you know, finding the, the work, work life balance, which is a struggle for a lot of people being able to understand that better. So I guess my takeaway here is, uh, apply the marketing lens to your career journey and don't be afraid if you have a short stint or there's a layoff or there's a riff, right? Like, or heck, even if you straight up got fired, what is the story that you can weave through your whole career and your next job is going to add something else to that story? Um, so, yeah. I love that. I always tell people that you're the brand you're selling, right? In your career. So think of that. What appeals to you about brands and what appeals to you about decisions that you're making, right? Speaking of topics that a lot of people have a lot of opinions about that is changing a lot of industries, we would love for you to let us know how you see AI affecting your industry and how are you using it or seeing others use it now? Yes. I mean, it's got to be the hottest topic in most marketing circles as well, both from marketing leadership and individual practitioners, uh, for sure. I mean, my top level view on AI and marketing right now is it can absolutely supercharge your teams. I have not seen any place in which it fully replaces teams to date. Um, I have seen teams uh, shrink their headcount because they're using AI smartly. But what that's doing is it's finding people to work on those marketing teams who know how to use AI. So AI is not replacing marketing jobs right now, but it may be shrinking the workforce in favor of people who know how to use it well. Um, I have a good CMO friend of mine 
who speaks loudly and proudly about his team of four people that are four custom GPTs that he's built. One of them helps write his brand voice better. One of them helps um, shape his uh, demand gen campaigns more rapidly so he doesn't have to come up with it. But what he does is he takes the work from those GPTs and then he looks at it with a critical eye of 20 years and evolves it and moves forward. I think the main purpose of AI in marketing right now is to unlock us faster and get us unstuck on doing projects. It's not to be the final deliverable in what we're putting out to the world. Because we've all seen how bad that is. If you had an AI created created brand campaign or an AI created ad campaign, it's going to be really clunky. I had someone tell me the other day the quote, we know the bots are everywhere and it's very easy to see them. So it sounds like another skill for younger people wanting to go into marketing is also figure out how to utilize AI to supplement and to their advantage. Yes. Uh, oh, that hundred um, percent. I mean, I'm teaching my 10 year old kids how to prompt mid journey to craft the visual images that they want. I would expect that any marketer especially early in their career today, should bring a skill set of pretty robust understanding of how GPT, of like how any kind of chat GPT functionality works, and also visual AI as well. So whether that's mid-journey or Dolly, um, I think you need to be able to use both of those systems very effectively. If you're going to be an individual contributor on a marketing team, you should, should have a solid awareness of that. So another slight shift here. Um, We've talked a lot about your pivots, and that's clear that you've had a lot of successes making these pivots, but we also know that things don't always go according to plan in our career. So we would love if you have one or multiple sort of oh shit moments that you had happen throughout your career and what you learned from that. Oh, absolutely. I don't want to put the wrong picture out here. My career has been a (laughs) staggering amount of failures. Um, You know, I've worked at startups that have essentially gone under. We had to wrap things up and give funding back to investors and say, well, that didn't work. Um, I've had campaigns like individual marketing campaigns that we've spent a lot of money on and had really terrible return. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific story that I could share, but the thread here is the same as before. You, it's, it's a story you tell and it's important to tell yourself It's not about the failure. It's about what you learned and how you improved coming out of it every single time. The plan for your life and your career is to fail repeatedly and to learn from those failures. And again, I will say sometimes to have fun in them. I do think one thing I have learned, I'm solidly in my 40s at this point. I give a lot fewer fucks than I did in my 20s. Like I used to care so much about failure. And even if I knew I was learning from it, it just felt so heavy. I want everybody listening, if they are younger, to see how fast they can get to the mentality of being in your 40s, which is a failure does not define you. In fact, it makes you much better. And everybody does it. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, Your manager that says they're perfect and they have all these expectations, they have failed repeatedly on repeated occasions. Um, So... Yeah. I mean, I, that is my gift to everyone listening is I figured it out. Everybody fails and it does not define you. Let me think of one that's like really, really messy. I guess I'll talk about winding up my startup. So I spent three years devoting my entire life. Um, you know, I went a solid nine months at the beginning of the startup with zero salary. Like this is the world of startups, especially if you're a co-founder, you are putting a lot on the line, lots of uh, changes, the stress of hiring people. And then with a startup, maybe it wasn't the right people, not the people, but like what we needed for the business, having to fire people, um, the mess of trying a product, figuring out why it didn't work, pivoting, and then figuring out why that didn't work. You could call my entire startup a giant failure. We we wrapped it up. We said, thank you. This didn't work. We're so sorry. That said, it wasn't a failure. We made a big dent in the market. We, uh, my personal network grew massively from all these people who loved what we were building. Um, we showed the process. We showed what we were going through. We even ended up leaving our, the code that we built. We open sourced the code because a lot of people wanted to build off of what we did. So it wasn't a failure, but especially in the startup world, 
you know, whatever it is, 95, 98% of startups are going to fail. And so, yeah, spectacular failure is part of what I enjoy the most. I actually really appreciate that we're living in a more um, authentic world now where the term is building in public. It's not just saying all the Instagram worthy moments of what you did, but it's actually showing the things you learned and the places you failed along the way. And I love that we live in a bit more of a culture that accepts that and values that. So hooray for the, you know, the younger career folks coming up. It's okay to look at a failure, analyze it and like talk about it versus just pretending it didn't happen, which I think when I was younger in my career, maybe it was my own perceptions, but I also feel the business world didn't have the authenticity it does today. Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely, uh, lovely story, Melissa. Uh, I think this podcast is the embodiment of public failure. I mean, I think we've pretty much published everything we recorded, or waltz and all, uh, screw up, stumbles, um, mainly by me, I should stress, um, as I think <laughs> we were talking just before we <laughs> press record. Uh, but yeah, so I, th I think that's a really good uh, lesson to, to share with people. And yeah, yeah, I think the faster you can get through that, you know, everything's a crisis, you know, every small error or mistake is, is like the end of the world. Um, it's a lot better for people, you know, in terms of their, you know, both in terms of their career progression, because you've got to shrug it off, you've got to get up the next day uh, and, and, and show up and do your thing. Um, yeah. but also, I've say, I think, uh, you were mm -hmm. talking of which you've talked about maybe being in the second act of, of your career, shall we say? Um, how are you balancing your work with other things in your life right now? Great question. Let's be honest. I'm not. I have. So I after we wrapped up my last started in a startup in the end of September, I have actually have three side projects. I won't call them hustles because they don't make any money. Side projects, um, two of which are formal LLCs, actual companies that scaled up in that gap. You know, the startup wound down and those scaled up. And then I went ahead and took another job on top of that. I took a full-time day job on top of that with um, another startup. Um, and so I'm effectively running, you know, four projects in my mind right now. That said, 99% of what I do is on my day job, but I have these other things that do take up some bandwidth. And then I also am a mother of two kids and run a busy household. So am I succeeding in balance? No. Do I regularly reflect on um, trying to prioritize what matters most? Yes. So the only way that I get through, you know, finding work-life balance is a continual revisiting of what is the most important thing in this moment. And even at a startup where it feels like go, 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 you're going to build or die, you could do all of the things that are on that million item list and still fail. And so I learned that you have to make room for the priorities and sometimes the priority. And honestly, I would say most of the time your whole self, like your happiness, your healthiness, um, the health of your family. So I regularly have to reprioritize that, have to remind myself of that, but daily reprioritization is how I get through things. And sometimes that means the family actually is not prioritized, right? There is something that is really important to get done for the business, or it needs me now versus next week. The uh, You've probably heard of the two by two matrix of um, how urgent is it and how important is it? And if you haven't heard of this, everybody draw like a X and Y axis and put urgent on one and important on the other, and then drop where things are, because I think you'd be surprised. We spend a lot of our time doing things that are urgent, but they're not important. <laughs> Um, and sometimes we do things that are really not important, uh, but they make us, you know, uh, move along in the work or, or find more balance because we've got them off the plate. So you're going to make decisions, but I think it's really important to look at what you're doing and decide where it falls on the spectrum. And if you want to be in that corner of the uh, the quadrant, I guess it is. Yeah, we'll try and find some links. Is that the Eisenhower matrix? Is that the, cause yeah. it's about, it talks about delegation and yep. There you go. go. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a great, that. actually, that's a great book that comes to mind based when you said the word delegation. This is another big one. Um, Dan Martell's book called Buy Back Your Time has been really, really huge for me, more especially as I get to the middle of the career. It talks about actually placing a monetary value on the time and where you spend your time. And then it gives really tactical ways to essentially outsource the things that monetarily aren't worth your time. Are you spending a lot of time? You know, you could take this in just living your day-to-day -day life. 
Are you spending a lot of time cleaning the house where you could be making a hundred dollars an hour? Go pay someone else 25 an hour to clean the house, right? Like it's just that balance of monetary value and time. But that has been, um, I'm maybe not as like strict on the process that he uses in the book, but conceptually I come back to that a lot. Am I doing something that I should be outsourcing that someone else could do? And it either monetarily or just the time spent makes more sense to have someone else do it. I appreciate the mindfulness you're, you're sharing. It's that have those realistic conversations with yourself too, right? As we navigate careers and as they change, um, definitely resonate as, becoming a parent changes your priorities, whether or not you want it to, but not every day, right? Not all the time. Um, yeah. So I think that's a good thing to map out and leads directly into our next question, which you've already been sharing a bunch of great advice. So any more, uh, but this time think on advice you have received. Uh, and if you have any best and worst career advice that you have ever received. Best career advice comes from my main mentor over the 14 years at Google. Um, he was a, a, a boss and a high level manager and, and SVP at the company that gave me huge amounts of room to run at the beginning. And so actually one of those other to rewind back to an early career tip would be try if you can. I think it's more important to pick the people you work for than the thing you're working on, especially early in your career, because the people that you work for early on will give you the opportunity to grow. So People are always important. It's always good to have a good boss, but I think especially at the beginning of your career, the folks that you work for and with are the ones who are going to springboard you forward. So instead of just chasing a type of role or a even a specific company, latch on to the people that you know are awesome. So to that point, um, my kind of career mentor um, at Google, he gave me a critical piece of advice that actually came when I became a parent for the first time. I walked in and I told him I was leaving because I wanted to stay at home with my kids. I said, I quit. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, no. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think you heard me right. I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And we talked for a while about why I wanted to leave and how I wanted to be at home spending the real quality time with my family. And he'd seen his wife go through, you know, leaving the tech world and trying to come back. And his career advice was, Specific to me, but I think everyone could apply it. He looked at me and said, Melissa, you do four times the role. Just do the role one time and then spend time on the rest of your life and with your family and be there. Now, I think there's such a hustle culture that we often don't, especially as young career professionals, put limits on the work we're doing. We think if I do five times the work, I'm going to get five times the reward. And I'm here to tell you that's not always the case. So I don't mean shirk off at work, but I mean, really be critical about like what is going to drive your success and then don't go doing all the other stuff. Like pay attention to your life or freaking build a side hustle if you don't already have kids or do something else or um, do a volunteer job in addition to your day job to get expertise, but not just all about the job. Look at what you're doing and don't do four times the job, do, you know, do two times the job or do one time the job to look, you know, right. but it also is an exercise in setting boundaries and, um, not getting pushed around and understanding what like work versus the real world is. So I, I thought that was great career advice and it was specific to me, but I think it applies to a lot of people. We often hustle, 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 and we're doing three times the job. No, do one time the job and do it really, really well. And that's, that's what you need to do. That's great. Any advice that looking back, you're like, oh, I should not have taken that advice. Oh. Or are there sort of, are there sort of like, whatever the opposite of a hot take is, you know, what, 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 you know, what do people say that you just go, nah, that's not I mean, the case. Or, or I guess my hot take isn't a specific career advice, but it's the stuff where I'm like, oh, that is just messed up is I think a lot of times people get advice to work through a really toxic culture. And I think if I were to go back and tell myself something, and this isn't specific to a company, but I think in certain situations, you really try to fix something. I think it's okay at a certain point, put a little bit of effort into improving a scenario, working with a tricky manager or um, you know, setting more boundaries if you're being railroaded and being asked to do too much, like try to fix it. But at a certain point, it's okay to recognize that a situation is not putting you in your best scenario. And um, 
you may need to hear that from someone close to you at the time. You may not be taking it from me and applying that, but hear it in the back of your head, which is sometimes a situation, a manager, a culture is actually responsible for you not being able to succeed. Now, I want everybody to try to succeed within tricky situations first. That's how you learn. But even now, I'm talking to a lot of marketers that have actually in this tough economy taken marketing roles because they needed a job and they find themselves at a place where they are not set up to succeed. So even if they wanted to be great in their role, and even if they're trying, there have been some really ucky situations I've seen where I've looked at friends and said, I I think you need to find something different. Um, so I don't know if it's like a, a bad advice, but the advice, I guess the bad advice would be like, stick it out, like do your best, work for that manager because they know better. Like the company and the manager does not always know better. And if you're not getting what you need to succeed, it's okay to say, hmm, this isn't helping me do my best work. I need to go find something else. That's great. Uh, we've mentioned a few books, a few podcasts, but any, any in particular that you want to give a shout out to, uh, right now? Oh my gosh. So many podcasts and so many books. I would be happy to, if anybody connects on, connects on LinkedIn with me later and needs more, I'm happy to recommend them. I probably have way too many. Let's see. Gosh, there's so many marketing books. You know what? I'm going to go out of the box and instead of recommending a marketing book or a business book, I'm going to recommend a book that I found changed a lot of my uh, take on both work and life. And it's really out of the box. It's a book called Breath. Um, Actually, is it Breathe or Breath? It's Breath. And it's by a man named James Nestor. And it's about the history of how we breathe and the modern techniques of breathing and why we need to think about our breathing. And that sounds very weird and out of the box, But I'm all about bringing the stress of work and the pace of what we do and everything back to like you as a person. And it's, it was a book that really just changed a lot of my perspective in how I approach life and work. Um, I think it's more interesting than giving you another marketing book. There's probably about a billion marketing books you could read. Oh, if I had to give one, it's probably like something by April Dunford because she talks about positioning, um, and, uh, it's always classic and it's always valuable. So yeah, anything by April Dunford. Oh, and Mark, okay, one more. A podcast that I love because he's very much my vibe. Louis Grenier is a man who is a marketer and he hosts something called Every, uh, Everyone Hates Marketers, but it's incredible. His whole brand is called Stand the Fuck Out and it's about like getting rid of all the BS around marketing, all like the business school junk and just like being a good marketer. Like, creating things that people actually want to engage with and talking to humans in the right way. Um, so it's very much my vibe. If somebody needs a podcast recommendation that's really me and feels like me, besides my own podcast, mm. go, go listen to Louie. I love the realness that's coming through in all of your recommendations and in our whole conversation today. I think it's, it's a good reminder, right, to be yourself in your career and be mindful of what what you like, what you want as you're navigating a job, right? So that at the end of the day, we're hopefully, you know, enjoying what we're doing, no matter how many hours we're spending doing it, but we're not losing ourselves in the process for sure. I think that's always a good reminder. Uh, Lastly, you do a lot of things as you've been telling us about. Is there anything that you would like to pitch to us and our audience certainly will pitch you our podcast, but anything else? So definitely listen to the podcast. It's two pizza marketing. And if you're looking at getting into marketing, but not like in a huge big company, it's really, really chock full of actionable, um, you know, learnings direct from the mouths of marketers who are living in that world. Um, the second little thing I'll plug is I am a co-founder of something called Wednesday women. And our mission is to amplify and shine a spotlight on examples of executive women who are totally kicking ass out there. So we're not a community for women. We're for everybody to have more visibility into the amazing leaders, um, you know, women leaders across multiple industries. So that's a great one. The best thing to do would just be to follow us on LinkedIn and you'll get more examples. Um, And then really the big plug is what I'm building with my team at Matcha. We are building a platform for people who want to connect and network, but without all the noise without chasing the feed and trying to get all the followers and, you know, be an Instagram face for marketing. We're trying to give, um, and not just for marketing that came out because I'm thinking about marketing. Um, Matcha is 
basically a place where folks who want to grow professionally themselves or their business can invest in connecting with intention with other humans. One of our um, best first products is for any group or community, if you have a group or community, but you want to create more one-to-one engagements, we have matching programs where you can set the criteria and the program runs and connects individuals within the group for one-to-one matching on a regular cadence, however you set it. And companies like Gong, other communities like Marketing Ops, um, they are loving it because of the human to human element of what we are really searching for is that direct connection, those moments of growth, finding a new mentor, starting a new business, getting inspired. It happens on those one-to-one calls in an incredible way. So come and check out what we're building at Matcha. That's matcha.so is the URL. Awesome. We'll make sure we've got all of the links, uh, as I think some people like to say, in the comments, in the dibbly doos uh, down below. I don't know if that way, that way. Um, well, thanks, Melissa. Um, we're coming up to time, so I think we need to let you go. But thank you. It's been uh, fantastic having you. Well, it's lovely to meet you both. Um, yeah, thank you, you for having me. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Cheers, Melissa. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay, and Lisa, another one in the can. What are your reflections on our conversation with Melissa and all things marketing today? I loved so much of what she said. I especially liked her description of being a generalist and a specialist at the same time. I think in navigating that in marketing, and that's good advice for people who want to start their careers. Um, I also really liked just her career journey and talking about embracing the failures and telling a good story and being willing to try things, especially as things are evolving and marketing is evolving. So definitely someone who's had a lot of successes, but also has a good story to tell. What about you? Yeah, I thought those two sort of pivots that she described, all those two big ones, shall we say, like from, first of all, teaching in the corporate world, uh, particularly, you say, big big technology company like Google. I think it's really important for people to realize that they can do that. And especially as jobs and our careers do so much to sort of define our identity as in, in, in the modern world, that you can make those those switches and it is really possible. Um, from some of our previous you know guests, sometimes that can take a while, but it looks like uh, we've done a really great job. And then say that and breaking and realizing that you know, even a big brand name like Google maybe wasn't ticking all of the boxes that she wanted at, at that particular point in her life. Um, yeah, and going more entrepreneurial route was, uh, yeah, really interesting, really fascinating. Great. All right. Well, we have made it to the end of another episode of the podcast, which we know you found something interesting, entertaining, and even valuable today. So go ahead, if you haven't already, and subscribe on Spotify and YouTube and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Even better, if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want, you can visit Career Badger for a bunch of free resources. Or even better, download our mobile app for iPhone and get real human career coaching from Lisa. That's it from us. See you next time.